So, oh, okay, the first thing I want to do is going back to this, uh, actually, even if I can do this very basic thing, we can declare victory, which is, because uh, it's, it's, it'll be good progress. I want to take this, uh, I want to take this undoable entity data off the entity, because it's confusing and annoying to have it there. And I just want to have the undo system track this, right? So uh, whatever the old state of the entity is that we're going to diff off of, it's going to live in the undo system instead of here. And yeah. And then there you go. And um, it'll just record the last state of any particular entity ID. Um, so it, why don't we just be brave and we'll just delete this line <laughs> and see how many times that breaks. Yeah, like we're copying fields sometimes. It's not great. Like we're putting the position and all that. That's a garbage. Although, I mean, we have a little bit of a problem here. which is that we construct this entity, we register it, and then we set the mesh, I think. And so the undo system might get the state of the thing without the mesh, and then we undo backwards and it's not there. So we may have to deal with that, we'll see. Um, okay, so uh, 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 undo. What we're going to do here is we're going to say, instead of old undoable data, we're going to say old E is uh, get old entity from this handler for E. And old E is going to have an undoable data on it, right? Except we're storing the base data and the derived data separately. Yeah, that's probably fine. So well, that's not going to compile. So let's make a stub for that so that we can just keep finding these low hanging fruit problems. So uh, get old entity. is going to just be there we go okay um, so I want to do this with just stubs because I want to review what everybody is doing um, you know, because, because, <laughs> um, you know, there might be some requirement that I've forgotten about that uh, is very important to accommodate. So here again, we're assuming this is on E, but we have old E. Um, really, old E should be there. Okay. Um, so we're copying that undoable data. So this is, so li the <laughs> later we're going to change this to something that selectively serializes things to produce the minimum amount of data. 
Right now, when we record an undo action like this, we're going to say, oh, it's a move. And here's the undoable data before the move. Here's the undoable data after the move, right? And then, so this is like, uh, th this looks like three things, but it's actually two different things. So uh, record the entities before and after states uh, in the undo action. And then this one is uh, update old ease undoable data to, to the present, to the current state. So it's a little bit misleading to pack these together like that in three consecutive lines because they mean different things. So we want to put uh, in, put that into old e undoable data. In fact, let's do this and then that. Because this is about setting up the undo action. All this is about setting up the undo action and retiring it. And then this is like, okay, now update the state. And we're not going to touch the derived data yet, even though that all needs to change as well. We're just doing the base for now. Oh, and that's for a redo. So here we're doing the same thing. Okay. So we get the old entity. So now if we're undoing, right, then that data from that undo action that we just recorded, we need to put that back into the entity's undoable data and the uh, and the old entities on doable data is that they start with the same state so that now if things change during the frame, it goes, changes forward. Um, and if it's a redo, you use the new data instead of the old data, right? Cause it's, you can go in either direction. So this is just old E and this is just old E. Um, old undoable data, line 503. And what's this one? Oh, this is, so for entity creation, right? Or rather, if we're, if we're undoing a destroy or redoing a create, then we need to initialize that undoable data based on the state that was recorded when we destroyed or created the thing. So, so again, we need to be able to do this and initialize that. All right. Okay, so now this is a weird one. I think this one can just go away. So sometimes we can clone objects in the gameplay. And when we clone something, we were doing this thing where we manually back up the old and doable data. And we don't really want to do that. Oh, yuck. Okay. This is something. Okay. This is something that we have. So we can clone a thing to multiple things and we rotate each one and we need to do the rotation based on what the thing was before, what the thing's orientation was before we modified anything. And so, yeah, uh, we need to do this. Uh, I 
think that's going to be right. That might break. Mirror projection visuals. Where is that declared? Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, entities, line 690. This is just. Yeah, another backup. Runtime only flags. Yeah, so the problem here I'm going to write down on my to-do list that we often make an entity and then set properties on it. So like the first frame after we make an entity we need to change state on it or something. All right. Undo line 369. Mark beginning. Uh, okay. called undo here for some, let's call it handler for consistency sake. Where's my thing? Hey, we compile now. We're totally not going to run. If we try to run now, we barf, but that is fine. That is as expected. Now, my next step would be to declare that procedure but my food dude is two minutes away. So let's actually take it into uh, mildly off topic questions are allowed because it's food break already. Um, I'm going to take a minute and run downstairs to meet this dude. Uh, what was the question that somebody had that I said, wait until food time? I don't remember now. Um, Someone's asking about thread local storage. I'll answer that after I meet the food dude. Okay, back in a minute.
Okay, the food dude has duded the food. And we are back. So while I am duding my food, then we can do mildly off topic questions. Still about programming. You meant a global flag if any entity has changed and it scans all entities for a change. You have to set that flag. When do you set the flag? Uh, we don't actually spam this every frame, though, actually. Uh, it only happens at, at certain predetermined times. Um, I think, or eh. I mean, if you can afford to do it on any frame, you might as well do it every frame because you don't want frame hitches, but If the game simulation is deterministic, same player actions leads to same game outcomes. You could record the player actions instead of the chain of state changes, as long as all of those changes have a reverse operation. Yes, I am aware of this. Um, how do you go backward, though? Right? You say, as long as all of those changes have a reverse operation, well, okay. Most things naturally don't have a reverse operation, right? Like if you're going to set a value on an entity to Y, how do you go backwards to whatever the value was before that? You have to make that reversible somehow. Guess what? That's the code we were just looking at. What is for dinner? Poke bowl, but it's not really a bowl. It's like poke cardboard carton. I've implemented the implicit context system in C++ with thread local global variables. But I noticed every access to the context generates three LEA instructions because of the TLS. Do you think it's still worth it? How often is the context accessed in big programs? Um, so LEA instructions are not by themselves slow. What makes that slow or not is whether is whether they're causing cache misses. So, so that's, I don't really remember how TLS is implemented, so I can't answer that question. How often is the context accessed in big programs? It's a very broad question because it depends on what you put in there. Um, the most useful context members, I think, are accessed when you're doing things that otherwise would be pretty slow, like heap allocating or um, logging a log message. Uh, but 
And you certainly can put just regular variables in there. So, I don't know. Someone's asking if the goal of making the language pleasant when dealing with memory has been achieved. I would say, I would say we've gone pretty far toward meeting that goal, but also my idea of what that means now is very different from what it was when we started doing things. Um, to get the rest of the way there, I think I think it involves work that we do once all the basics of the language are are uh, finalized. Because, you know, it's it's like things things that the compiler or the libraries help you with. And so that's a little bit lower priority than, than basic things. How are dynamic arrays implemented? Do they keep memory aligned? Well, they're not implemented in a sense. Like the thing that allocates your dynamic array is just a library routine that you can call your own version of. So there's no real answer to that. Have I tried Go, D, or Rust since my initial video? No. Nope. I'm too busy to spend time programming in various languages. It's just not, it just doesn't work that way for me. I have been taught that business logic should not be tested through the UI and instead be tested via a command line script. That's wrong. I have been struggling with this view. I am wondering what your thoughts on this are and whether or not applying it to the undo redo system would yield more convenient tests. Okay. So the one thing about not being able to test about not testing things through the UI is being able to run a batch test from a server or something is very convenient, right? And it's a good way to thoroughly test your things. Um, but that doesn't mean a separate command line script has to do that because the more complicated your program is, the more there's just going to be functionality in there that is very deeply separated from the command line arguments. And like, do you have to program a bunch of command line arguments just to propagate test instructions? That's bananas. So I would say that that falls into this category of advice, which is most advice, which is well-meaning but mistaken and will do more harm than good if you follow it too much. Someone's asking about SOA. And does it have the assumption that you are performing a bulk operation on the structs? Well, yes. That's what it's for. It seems like it would be counterintuitive to have a one-time operation where you change the structure of memory. Why? Why? Oh, we don't change the structure in memory. You either leave it stored as SOA or non. That's not something you change back and forth all the time because that would be slow. You can, on various occasions, like if you have a non-SOA version of a struct and you want to assign it to an SOA slot or something, the compiler will do that conversion for you, but that's not meant to be a thing that you do rapidly all the time, right? That's a data copy which you'd like to avoid.
When rendering, do you send the command directly to the graphics card when it is called by the program, or do you add it to a buffer of commands to be dealt with later? Um, the answer to that is that all modern GPUs buffer up instructions that you don't even exactly know what they are, and then flush that when they deem it appropriate. So it's not really something that you directly control ever. Do I ever lurk in other game development streams? Uh, very rarely, simply because the pace of most streams is pretty slow, honestly. <laughs> like even when I host people sometimes, I'm just like, oh, I hosted this guy and he's not really saying very much and not really typing very much. I go to Handmade Hero sometimes because Casey's a friend of mine. Is there any aspect of the language I find currently lacking? Well, it's not done, so there's plenty of things that are lacking, but we're working on them. Someone is asking, what do I usually define as a prototype? And the answer is, I don't really think in terms of prototypes anymore. I have a lecture about developing prototypes on YouTube, but that's from like 15 years ago or something. <laughs> I don't do things that way anymore. I just build the things that I want to build and I build them in a way that gets uh, where you get a lot of momentum early, right? And you can see what you're building early and then refine it. I'm not gonna answer the parallelism feature question because somebody already asked that on the stream, sorry. Is there anything Haskell does that I like? Not really, no. Do I see Chris Hacker anymore? Not much. Okay. Any on topic questions about exactly what we were doing before the food dude showed up? About this undo system? Or should I dive right back into it? Off topic question again, you're writing a scanner and it's a big switch statement. That doesn't sound right, first of all. Your friend told you to put each long case into its own function, even though these get called once. Is her advice good? I'd have to see the code. It's very suspicious to me that you have a giant switch statement to begin with. Um, I mean, I guess I could see it structured that way. But yeah, I mean, you probably want to call functions, yeah, to be sane. I mean, if that turns out to be slow, you can always, you know, re inline them. It's not a big deal. Okay. A uh, scanner is another word for lexical analyzer, like the first stage of a compiler. 
So he's sort of asking about a, you know lexical analysis phase, probably for a class, I would guess. Okay, so now we're going back to the undo system and we're moving the storage of the old entity state to, well, <laughs> one of the storages of the old undo state from the entity into the undo handler. There's of course two because we have this old undo state pointer thing um, that is also there for the derived data and we're gonna deal with that eventually after we get this other part working. And after I spill drinks on myself. Okay. Um, we had this stub where we were asserting false. So get old entity. And I'm gonna pass another argument because I think I wanna be a little bit hard line about this and say sometimes when I wanna get this, it must already exist. And other times it's okay if it does. Well, let's, let's get old entity. So here, if something is in this loop, it must already exist, I'm gonna claim, right? So we don't want to create it here. Um, here, actually, let's let's make separate routines. Let's say create old entity. We're going to be very clear about what we're doing and not be mushy. Uh, here. We're moving something, it really had better exist. We had better have an undo record for this or we did something wrong. I just know these asserts are gonna fire, but that's part of getting the code right or getting your idea about what you're doing right. If we're creating or destroying an entity, Okay, I'm going to say that if we're creating, we shouldn't have a record, right? And you know what? We shouldn't be doing this. Okay, so we're only in, in whatever our storage is for these entities, we're only gonna maintain things that are actually live, right? So we're gonna have a get, we're gonna have a create, and we're gonna have a remove. And these are all incomplete. Okay. Well, how do we store these entities? Ideally, we would have a hash table. Do we go straight for the hash table or do we do some super lame Let's just be so lame. No, nah, let's use a hash table, why not? Okay. We're gonna have a hash table. It's gonna be a table from ID to whatever. So I'm gonna say 
uh, old e is find handler dot old entity table. Oh, did we call it table find? Table find pointer handler dot old entity table. Comma. Um, e dot entity ID, right? We're going to assert old E is not null, and we're going to return it. That's it, right? Now for create, we're going to say if we're a developer, let's just put in this assert where we say this and we assert that it is null because that had better not be there. We don't really have an extra debug switch right now, which maybe we should. Um, okay. So because we're going to create one, you know, here I'm going to say uh, dummy is entity copy undoable data. Wait, do we do that manually? Uh, So we just make an entity and then we put it in the table, which is going to be a copy, but whatever. We should have an add by pointer or something. So uh, So you have an old entity, and then, hmm. We don't have a way to return the pointer to the thing that's actually in the table. Actually, let's do that. Okay, so we create an old entity, we get an old entity, and remove old entity is just going to be do we not have a table remove? How is that even possible? I know that's why we... I know that's why we have table find pointer. Who calls that? Did we put a remove somewhere else for some reason? Maybe I was doing it for a demo program. Okay, so the problem is it's not straightforward to remove something from this kind of a hash table. Because so there's two kinds of hash tables. You can have a kind of hash table that 
chains things together in buckets under each hash value, and there it's easy to remove something. Or you can do this kind in which you just keep putting things in consecutive buckets, right? So if you look at our table find, So we basically say, find the index of the bucket. And then while our hashes are non-zero, then if the hash is the right one, and if the key is the right one, we return that value, right? So. We could we could either do the good thing, which would be like to scan forward to find find the last guy who has the same hash and you know map that backward the problem is you could run together two different hashes and then it's not clear to me if you know what the right answer is without moving an arbitrary amount of stuff so uh, maybe I do a thing where we just stomp the um, we stomp the key value with an invalid key that will not match anybody. I think that's what we do. How do you handle it when two things happen on the same frame? Wait, what? With this kind of hash table, how do you handle it when two things happen on the same frame? I'm not sure what those have to do with each other. What is two things happening on the same frame have to do with a hash table at all? Those things are orthogonal issues. If they're just consecutive, what makes it different than an array? Because you don't, because the expected case is that you don't iterate through this loop very much. You maybe look once or something, right? This is just to handle if you get very unlucky or if your table is way too full, but the table will auto expand before it gets full. How much do you store in the undo stack? Uh, enough data to undo the information, to undo the operation. If the table stores things consecutively, how does it determine what happened first? Okay, this is not a table storing consecutive actions. This is a table storing backup state for every gameplay entity one entry per entity, right? So that later, if one changes, we compare it versus the previous state, and then we know what to record. That's what this table stores. So we don't care about sequentiality in this table at all. Yeah. Okay. Well,
Yeah, I'm gonna say this is just a table clobber entry. And then I'm gonna make this routine. I'm gonna say table clobber entry. Uh, we're going to call this invalid clobber key. Without having to expensively operate on the table, we just replace the key with a key that the user knows will never legitimately be searched for. Um, this means the table stays just as full as it was. Um, until we resize at which time we ignore anything that used the clobber key. Okay, well, here, We're going to put that there. And uh, so when we resize, expand, Okay, so when we expand, so if people didn't think about the fact that there could be clobbering happening, we don't, we don't want to accidentally throw some things out. But if they do call clobber, then we assume that they set this clobber key to the right thing. So, uh, yeah. Let's do this. Okay. Um, let's just call it clobber key. Clobber key, and this is. Uh, Right? Okay, so we set the clobber key. Only call this once. All right. Remember how I said we would declare victory if we got one simple thing done? Sometimes a simple thing is not a simple thing. Okay, so when we do clobber, we say assert table dot clobber key is set, all right? And then um, we get the hash for the key. I don't want to call this invalid clobber key anymore. I just want it. Uh, 
So we get the hash. So we get the hash and we do the same damn loop that we've been doing. And if the hash matches, if the key matches, then table dot keys index is the clobber key instead and return true, return false. Okay. Well, then here, uh, we want to clobber the entry. We don't pass the clobber key anymore. Um, here we say an undo handler has old entity table, which is a table mapping from PID, which is an entity ID, to entity, right? Um, So when we reset undo, okay. This is actually going to be the default clobber key, but we set it anyway. Okay. We wanted a pointer to table given to table. Why? Okay, that's fine. We can pass a pointer for now, even though that's not what the pointer and table find pointer is supposed to mean. Okay, so we don't have reset. We call it table reset. It's fine. When we have more namespace libraries, we can call that reset and it'll be work. Uh, clobber key, 189. All right. Oh, I forgot to, uh, when we expand, I forgot to check the clobber key. So for every hash, if if we didn't set the clobber key or Uh, table dot clobber key uh, or old key sub index is not equal to the clobber key, then we add. So if it is equal to the clobber key, we get rid of it. And then we just maybe don't have as many items. Keys sub index is 
since I'm doing this, I'm just going to say key, not k, key, key, and then, but what's wrong? Looks like an overloaded operator. What are you talking about? I should give a better error message for that, but... Table is a hash table. Clobber key is a value of key type. That looks right to me. I don't know what the compiler's problem is. Am I missing something? Am I smoking crack? Do we have a compiler bug? Simple things are not always simple. How do you expand the table if changing the size also changes which index results from a given hash? Uh, well, you don't store the index after you resize. The index is only valid for a certain table size. You don't keep it around. Can you keep count of the number of clobbered elements to help pick the next size? You certainly could. For now, I just want this to work. How am I handling memory? Do I have a memory pool or something? That is comp It's a long answer that I don't want to sidetrack on right now. You could get memory from anywhere you want. Okay. Yeah, this is a weird, weird, weird thing. This should be of key type. And this should be of key type. Did I mess up? I mean, I might have to put more debug information in the compiler, it's not, which is good because people will enjoy that having that. But uh, so let's say just for now, what if I make this a table of int int? That won't work because we'll get what is catching my alt tab. Yeah, so now we're just going to complain. Um, I am not sure why it's saying overloaded operator. If this works, I might just Source code location. Oh, right. Oh, my God. Okay. So the problem here is that some people somewhere, which I should, I should provide more information here, but someone somewhere in the program is making a hash table where the key is a source code location. And we don't define equality on structs right now. OK, 
here's what we need to do. Yay, okay. Uh, can clobber is false. Let's hope this all works. Now we're getting into compiler feature territory. So, because uh, some tables are created with key types that don't Wait, how do we match the key then? Oh, because we, wait. No, we, that can't be right. Hold on, rewind, rewind, abort. We must support equality. Oh, equality, right. Equality on a struct is just a mem comp. So that's not actually the problem. The cast to int is the problem. It's not valid for everybody. That's fine. I was about to get carried away. I apologize. So how do I do this? Um, I'm not sure. So what's going on is someone somewhere in the program is instantiating a struct with a key type maybe we handle double equals correctly for structs but not not equals like do we compile if i do this yes oh my god okay here we go So we detect equality on structs, but not not equal. That's so stupid. And people wonder why we're not giving them access to the compiler yet. It's stuff like that. Stuff like that. So it's not that key type the key type is a variable, right? It's so it could be anything, but like structs are supposed to be comparable with equals or not equals, and apparently we just forgot not equals. Okay. Whoa, we're running. I doubt I'll be able to successfully undo. Oh my god, I'm undoing! It worked! Look, I'm pushing this block around. Oh no, I pushed it into a corner and I can't get it back. Let me undo. That, we can declare victory, sort of. I mean, I have to make sure it works in the editor, which God only knows, but... Wow, okay. I didn't totally expect that to work and not trip off asserts. Like, look at all the crazy st stuff we did. I mean, maybe, maybe clobbering. All right, here's what we do. Oh, there we go. That didn't take long. Um, see, that was a test that didn't come from the command line for the person who was asking about this. Okay, so we're saying get old entity and it doesn't exist. Freaking Windows. All right, so let's build a debuggable build there. But still, that worked better than I had any right to expect. Okay. Let's try this again. As soon as it gets to this level. We barf. All right. So we're getting old entity. 
and it does not exist. We're calling scan one entity. <clears throat> We're noting a destroyed entity. It's a particle emitter. I think we maybe just don't record particle emitter. Oh, that's probably not right. Let me just check though. No, we, we catch them up, but we don't explicitly exclude them. Okay. So a particle emitter is destroying itself Um, but it doesn't exist in the undo system. Now, interestingly, this isn't a new bug, actually. This is a bug that we had before, but that I wasn't asserting on because it was on my list of things to debug. So now we've made it more serious and now it has to be handled. Let me get a colder tea. Why do I use an IDE still? Well, I'm using a debugger right now. I don't use any of the rest of this to build programs, but this is the best debugger that I have access to, so I'm using that. Okay. What am I doing here? Uh, I'm trying to figure out why we have a particle source. Is this any time there's a particle source? Um, let me, let's look at the, the handler. It's got pending actions. A creation of this entity ID. Yeah, so what's happening is we created and destroyed this particle system before we acted on it. Right, so, or wait. Schedule for destruction of this particle system. We note that we destroyed it. And so we record any changes. Okay. Yeah. This is a problem, I guess. Okay. So wait, when we know created entity, we don't actually create, we could create the record here. But I would have thought that node ECD does that. Node ECD, which stands for Entity Creation or Destruction. 
Nope. Okay. Create old entity. So here, when we add this to pending actions, we're just going to do that. See if that helps. Ah. So now we're double creating. Why are we double creating? Well, let's run that in the debugger. See, sometimes when you try to be a little bit meticulous about things, you have problems, but it's better than just being confused about things. Okay, so we're calling undo mark beginning. Oh, right. So pending, the handler is pending actions. Let's make an optional argument for now because we just want to make sure that we have space for people. But if people got created via that method, uh, uh, ooh, okay. Refuse to record pending actions. I also realized I don't, oh, I do call table reset somewhere, right? Don't we? I'm a little squirreled out by reset undo versus undo mark beginning. We're going to maybe have to think about that a little bit. But uh, for here, let's just say create old entity. Okay, so we only assert, well, actually, uh, doing the wrong thing. If optional if okay if not optional assert and no matter what return old e there we go great oh wait that's not a developer anymore statements in Okay, I'm so, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking. If old E, assert false. There we go, that's what I meant. This is still going to assert as soon as we start. Because I didn't, oh, maybe not. All right, we got further. Why don't I just make debug builds every time for now? I don't, I don't have generating a debug build bound to a hotkey right now, so when I just slam the hotkey, it goes to the wrong thing. 
So these playthroughs also have undos in the recording, which is why this is testing the undo system. All right, so. We're creating an old entity. I'm doing an undo. So we're undoing a destroy. The destroy should have clobbered the thing. So did we not do it? Looks like a valid entity. So either we did not remove it from the table or clobber it, right? Or the clobber is broken, which is possible, or something else. Oh, well, I gotta give food guy a tip before I forget. Food dude, I mean, not food guy. That's a different guy. Food dude. Food dude. All right, that is taking care of. So this is one of those things that's a little bit annoying to debug because it's like, well, Okay, let's hope that this entity ID, let's run it again and see if we get this same ID. And if so, then maybe that ID won't happen in the other levels and then we can set a breakpoint on it, maybe. <laughs> All right, so. It is the same ID. Okay, so in, or, oh, let's, let's check the pendings. No pending actions, okay. So now when we destroyed this, we should have clobbered it. So let's, let me go to my real text editor for a second. When we noted a destroyed entity, oh, we don't here, right? In the same way that we do a create here, we need to do a destroy here. Um, Let's see, let's see if that helps us or if that makes it even worse.
Oh, we got further. Okay. Well. Wait, we're barfing in draw. So maybe we're not backing up. Remember how I said we might have a problem where we're creating things and then like not all the information is maybe there. That might be happening. I don't know. Uh, 1209. What is going on? We're asserting, okay, there's something in potentially visible entities and it's scheduled for destruction. That bothers me. Why would that have changed? I don't think that this has to do with the undo changes that we are doing right now. I think I just haven't run this test in a few days and this broke differently. Well, when we schedule for destruction, we don't appear to remove it from potentially visible entities. So of course, okay, we got to search to see only three files even refer to this, right? So potentially visible. That's when we reset it, when we reset the entire entity manager, that's that file. This file adds it to potentially visible entities. Ah, here we go, unregister entity. removes it. Okay. Schedule. Okay. So schedule for destruction. Removes it there. So that's weird. How is this happening? shouldn't be possible unless we destroy something while we are iterating. That's always bad news. That is always bad news. I'm not sure why we would be doing that in, whoops, debug build. Not sure why we would be doing that in the draw loop, but let's see. And then what level, we could just load straight to this level and then we test so it goes faster. universe name is bardic arrangement. So we're going to go to local.variables and we're going to start on bardic arrangement. 
because we, we can just test that one level. So we go straight to it. Let's just try that, right? So we start, we're on Bardic Arrangement. I press Control T, and we get the same problem. Great. Um, so that's faster. This assert is not going off. So why, what, what the hell? Okay, it's time to do unreasonable things. Let's just loop over the whole thing and assert. We'll do that there. Someone remind me to get rid of these remove me's. And here, so anytime we set scheduled for destruction, we're just going to check this. Maybe somehow the undo system is setting scheduled for destruction. I don't. Oh. I don't think it can set it manually, though. Maybe we get in the array more than one time. That's my theory, is we're somehow getting in the potentially visible array. Oh, the runtime only flags. Right. That was one of the things that was getting manually. We'll talk about this in a second. Entities line 740. That seems like a different place. Yeah. So here we're at least catching the problem. Or uh, actually, to make sure this is where it's happening, right? We can, before we set scheduled for destruction, check. And then we do this, we do this, we call in register entity, and then after we check. And uh, so this one shouldn't go off, and this one should. And that's how you sort of, whoops, that's how you sort of pincer attack to determine where exactly a problem is happening. Okay. Yep. So this isn't going off. This one is. So that's good. Uh, let me write down to remove that. Okay. The problem is we only remove something from this list if it has this runtime only flag set. And unfortunately, the runtime only flags are stored in that undoable entity data. I don't know why. That might just be a mistake or there might be a reason for it. If there's a reason for it, then we need to sync them. But I'd rather, I'd rather not fricking put it there, frankly. So if an entity is hidden, if it's in a moving entities array, or if it's in potentially visible entities array, uh, those are all accounting things that only should be for the entity manager. So like, I don't think that we put that there. Now the question is, there might be some entities of version one okay we're just going to leave this dumb field nobody's going to use it and then i'm going to just put runtime only flags here None of this gets serialized.
this used to be an undoable undoable data but that seemed like a big mistake bro okay let's just see what have i i don't even know maybe chaos will occur maybe there was a reason that needed to be there well we successfully tested this level see you just Untie the little knots that you tied over all the time you were building the system, and it gets So not all these tests are going to play correctly. With some of the timing-oriented interactions, the tests don't play that correctly. Anymore. But most of the levels should play that correctly. This is one of my the infinite levels. So this, oh, this. Some of these I don't want to spoiler myself on, so I might have to close my eyes. All the ones that have failed so far are ones that I expect to fail because for different reasons than what we're talking about today. I need to record a shorter solution to this level. These levels, those are also my idea. Closing my eyes, I don't want to get spoiled. So eventually, all those levels you just saw are going to look nicer, like these ones. These are sort of the levels that have had the most visible work so far. Turn it down a bit. Maybe that's a little better. I don't know. Maybe it's still too loud. Yeah, this is seriously dank spoiler zone territory. That's true. Well, the undo system seems to be working pretty well, which is good. But maybe next stream will be the next step. Uh, I still have to test it out on the editor after all this test.
That was my level right there. Can they be run headless? I don't know what you mean by they. Huh, those weren't supposed to fail, those two dragon levels. So I'm not sure what happened there. We have to look into that. Oh, it might be the orientation when cloning thing that I changed earlier today. We need to test that. Ah, oh, this test is totally broken. Yeah, like I said, all the ones with timed elements, they don't totally work right now. That one was supposed to fail because it's an unfinished draft level. There's like 10 unfinished draft levels that are in the list here for some reason. Wait, didn't we already do these? Maybe not. Maybe I'm hallucinating. I don't want to spoiler myself on these. These are Maya's levels. All right, that was everything. We didn't fail on that many levels. The only ones that I didn't expect fails on were these mirror clone dragons one and two. And so, uh, so you know, we were tested 154, we failed 11, it's fine. <laughs> Since we expect all those. Uh, accept these so let's I just want to know Okay, well, oh, I just did an undo and it locked up. What just happened there? Well, the, the cloning, oh God, Windows. I can't find my mouse cursor to click on the button. There we go, all day. Um, so we have two problems. We have an assert.
And we have the fact that the orientations don't come out correct, even though they're frickin' supposed to. Actually, let me just, let me make a test level, like this level right here. Um, we can just set this up. All right, well, the editor has problems right away. And maybe I should stop being so picky about... All right, let me write down the list of problems. Dragon clone. Undo on dragon clone. And editor usage. This is actually the most important problem because nobody can do anything. Like I can't click, I can't check in this code if it asserts on the editor. So, uh, oh, I wasn't running from the editor. So that was just me trying to destroy an entity, trying to clobber something. Oh, we don't set the clobber key. What? How did we not set the clobber key? We never call undo reset. We don't really have a table in it or undo in it. All right. I doubt that's the only problem because we're calling this in a totally different way. Whoops. Debug build. Debug build. All right, so we load, delete. Hey, we can delete things. We can undo those deletions. We can select a mirror. We can rotate it. We can undo those rotations. We can select a lot of things. We can override color them. We can pick all these colors. We can undo all the colors. We can delete. We can paste guys and edit fields and undo all those things. I don't know. The editor kind of seems to work, maybe. I don't know. I don't know, people. What do you want from me? Ocean. Oh, let's go to a level with an ocean. Do some frickin' ocean edits. Because those are different. Undo those. And then these, which are not undoable, but which shouldn't crash anything. Well, it seems okay for now. Sometimes you got to break some eggs. If people have a problem, we'll fix it. Windows is mad because the Benny Hill music stopped. We never call undo reset sounds imperative. Well, maybe. I mean, it's not exactly an init function, though. It's a reset function. So, like, eh, you know, okay. So let's go back to our previous situation. 
since we're no longer worried about the editor. Okay, so this is what it says. Well, I guess that's right. I forget how to do oh I forget how to do this level and not get owned by the dragon. Yeah, see this, they're both supposed to be facing to the right. But in fact, one of them ends up facing south. That is wrong. Of course, I'm able to undo now and it's not barfing. So uh, I maybe we also fixed, that was an assert happening. What did we do in the editor? Oh, the, yeah, maybe that's the same problem. Okay, so I want to just set up this same situation on uh, like this level, which is Bardstone test. Okay, so we're just going to say, look, there's a mirror, there's another mirror. Was that the right one? And then uh, let's delete some of these things. We don't need all these things. They're just going to confuse me. And let's go back to the palette level. Let's pick a nice dragon and we'll put them there and rotate them like that, like that. I don't know, something like that. Okay, so bam. Well, let's put the player somewhere where she doesn't just get killed. Okay, so it kind of depends on which order it does them in, which one turns, but one of them is ending up in the wrong orientation, clearly. And I think I know why. I'm not sure. Is there no way to run the automatic test for just the level you're on? Yes, there is. I, I totally demonstrated that a few minutes ago. It's just that that's, I know that the test will fail. So I'm not that interested. I, I want to understand why it's failing. I don't, I, you know, yeah. So, um, so we had this clone situation. The problem is Okay, let's put this the problem is we're changing the orientation once and then we're rewriting it the second time around. So, uh, well, I think anyway,
We're going to call this entity uh, source. We're going to make a very long name, source entity orientation before clonings. Wait, what? Why am I doing that? Why doesn't the Mirage store its orientation on itself? Oh, because it could change. Yeah, okay. Whatever, we're just going to continue doing it this way. Um, R dot source entity orientation before clonings is uh, fudge. I only have the ID here. So, you know, here's where we're picking which thing gets reflected in a mirror and I uh, know quaternion. All right. Um, maybe somebody else calls that routine also. I don't know. Oh, we got to rename it. is not oh, scan results okay now I can't write the executable because I've got it open in the freaking debugger all right So now we go to um, what's it called? Oh, it's mirror clone dragons. Or is it clone dragon? Why is it? All right, so test. So for the person who was asking about this, hey, we succeeded. How about this one? Hey, we succeeded. So great. Um, I kind of feel like we should rerun the test over everything again. So let me start that up and then let's do it. Let's do it on a release executable which will take 30 seconds to build. Get another snack while this is happening. Okay, let's run this and we'll do some questions while it's uh, running. Does anyone have questions?
Uh, you said you forgot how to do the level, so I thought running the test might remind you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can actually slow down the playback speed, too. So there's that. Why was a dragon ghost image appearing on the purple circle in the test level you just made? I don't remember seeing that problem, but there is a bug that results in a ghost image showing up in the wrong place sometimes. It's on the bug list, so that might be what you saw. <laughs> Lambda calculus is really easy to implement. That's true if you want it to be really slow and have a lot of problems. What happens if you have to debug a level you haven't played? Well, then you have a problem and you have to cancel the project because it's too hard. Not questions, questions and questions. You could have used generative tests to figure out what tests fail and then run them only visually. Well, I can do a lot of things that involve more programming. Will it, this come with an HTTP server? Um, I don't know. Like writing a basic HTTP server is actually really easy. The hard part is like all the other weird stuff. So like as soon as you want SSL support or something or cookies, that's the annoying part. Like a, a HTTP server that responds to basic HTTP and serves documents is pretty easy though. I don't know. I'm not going to write it, but somebody might. Did I get the 5.1 headphones? No, they're scheduled for delivery tomorrow. What is that PID type of reflector and reflected? It's a, I think it's a 32-bit integer. It's just an entity ID. PID is like a historical name that doesn't make that much sense. It's an entity ID. You love my past games. Keep it up. Thank you. We're going to keep making games. Uh, did you hire Jonah Ostroff or just license the game? We can't talk about that stuff right now. Uh, sorry. When we announce it, we will announce it. Is the entire project written in this new language? Yes. Uh, we do interface with a few libraries written in C. For example, uh, you know, we use the STB image library and STB sprintf for some things. Uh, you know, just like you might link to a few libraries from any project, but for the most part, it's all code in the new language. Why do you make your own engine instead of using Unity or UE? That is a long, long answer that I don't want to do right now. Um, <laughs> somebody could maybe link you on YouTube to me ranting about that. Do you find it more difficult to design interactive block pushing puzzles to have good insight moments compared to line puzzles in the witness? How do you avoid them just becoming depth first search problems? Okay, it's, it's too soon for me to answer that definitively because we're not really that far into designing the new levels for this game. Um, we're working that out right now. But I will say that when you go into it, knowing what the idea of the level should be, then as long as that idea is kind of clear to the player, then they have a good probability of having that kind of insight moment that you're talking about. So 
Oh, there's one more thing I should test before I check this in. How are the compile times comparing the no jobs compile against the multi-threaded version? Um, the multi-threaded version is not that much faster because the only thing that's multi-threaded right now is the parser, and the parser doesn't take that much time. Um, so no jobs is not that much slower. But, you know, as time goes on and we parallelize more, it'll become proportionally different. How can you still program so late at night without it devolving into just a series of mistakes to be fixed later? Well, I will tell you, right around now, I'm starting to get tired. You know, I didn't sleep that much last night. I slept like six and a half hours. So not on full rest. If I were starting to do something difficult right now, that might be a bad idea. But I'm not. I'm just tidying up the thing that I started earlier tonight, and that's not so bad. What about modding support? Will people be able to create their own levels entities? Um, I don't know if we're going to do that in the initial release, but uh, if people dig the game, then maybe we'll release modding support shortly afterward. It's going to be hard just to get this game done, let me put it that way. But, um, you know, if people want to be creative with it, then I want to support that. So, yeah. Any new features in the pipe for the compiler or still mostly tightening things up for the release? Uh, still mostly tightening things up for release. In fact, the past month has actually been work on the game just to make sure that stuff is working out. So we haven't done that much compiler stuff lately. Sad to say, but we'll get back to it soon. Who is that person that, that you were saying designed some of the levels? Um, we just we have a summer intern who's uh, doing design with me, and she's doing a good job. So that's uh, you know sometimes you do something and it works out, and this is working out great. And we're going to be able to ship a lot of the levels she makes, and the ones that we won't ship are just because well probably. It's too early to say anything definitively, but any of the levels that we've made that we won't ship, it's probably because, you know, they use rules of interaction that we've decided are not the right ones. But that's part of the process is we're, dis we're deciding what the gameplay rules should be as we work on things. Is there anything in the compiler that may benefit from usage of GP GPU? It's hard to say. I mean, there's so much headroom we have on the CPU to go faster. Uh, but once that's done, can you use the GPU to help compile? Maybe. Um, it's just not an area that I have a lot of experience with. It's really hard. Like GPU pipelines are really deep. So you need to be able to have a thing that is very separate from the rest of your workload. Um, but maybe such a thing can be found. Hey, look, we finished. And we only failed nine levels now, and they're all the ones we expected, so that's great. Uh, okay, there was one more thing I was gonna test, which was to go in here and turn on the cheats. And I wanna go to here, and I wanna do this. And I wanna do this. And I wanna do this. I want to redirect this river and then make sure that works with the undo system. Spoilers! Spoilers! Yep, look, it's it's working. Yep, great. Ship it! Then here we say uh, 
undo system revamp part one. That's great. So part two is going to be converting the derived entity data to be stored in the same place and no longer on the entity. I don't want to do that tonight because like we were saying, it's, you know, you get tired, you make mistakes. Uh, part three then is going to be to go back to that code that I pointed out at the beginning. Um, this stuff and actually use this, which isn't being used yet. Um, I don't know how much of them, this I'm going to do on stream. Maybe, maybe tomorrow I'll find other things to do and then I'll continue where we left off on stream with these things. That would be nice. Has the intern made any games? Uh, I think she's made some class projects. I don't know. I don't remember. It was a long time since we saw her resume. Why would that one pointer be invalidated by further calls to that one mirror reflection pointer function? It's not that a pointer gets invalidated. It's that we're cloning an entity and the entity has already had its orientation changed the first time before we cloned it. So like we're rotating the entity, like we want the clone to be a clone of the entity before we did anything to it. But when we place the first entity, we rotate it. And then when we place the second entity, we're rotating it based on the already rotated entity pose, which is wrong. You can always steal Anna. Um, I think we want Casey's game to get finished, so it wouldn't be good to steal Anna. You were wondering how the lily pads work with the undo system. Um, what happens is we basically record the position of the lily pad when the player moved, right? So it would be tedious to have to undo a bunch of timed moves. Like if you sat there thinking and lily pads moved like 100 squares, you don't want to have to undo 100 things, right? So it's all tied to the player motion. So whatever motion happens since your last move gets undone. There are some rare cases in which that's a little bit non-ideal, but it's a lot better than having to undo every freaking lily pad yourself. How could the community be involved in the language other than using it? I don't know. I mean, we'll figure that out later. Zach Tillman, yay or nay? I haven't watched any of those videos. I can't say. I have one open in a tab here, but I haven't watched it. Any other questions before we go find someone to host? Oh, dude, I have a button here that runs an ad now. I can run a 30 second ad and make everybody watch it. Partners who run two minutes of ads an hour with your current viewers earn about $2 an hour from ads. So I can force you guys to watch ads while I per it probably already shows ads to you, right? If you're not, I, I subscribe to Twitch, so I never see those, but, um, I can force you guys to see ads and I can make a whopping $2 an hour. That would be amazing. Think about what I could do with $2 an hour. I could just sit here and just keep clicking the run ad button instead of hosting somebody. <laughs> I could make like $5. For every question about your Emacs theme, run an ad. That's a good idea. Also, when people ask me why I like to build engines instead of using Unreal. Well, we support LLVM. We already do support LLVM. If I could pick, pick the ads to be something really ridiculous and entertaining, I might. But, um, oh, wait. I can set the ad break length. Dude, I can run three minutes of ads in one click. That would be great. <laughs> that would be 
great. No, it wouldn't be great, really. I should use this stream marker thing to help me edit later. <laughs> Just run ads for the witness, yeah. a commercial of me ranting that's a good idea too so many good ideas I don't even know what to say about all of this all right I guess we're gonna find someone to host do I work out when I'm being good I work out uh, which is not lately no is the witness still the best thing I've worked on or is the programming language taking its place as your best? Pro you can't compare those. You can't compare a game and a programming language. Uh, in terms of its impact on the world, definitely the witness is, has had more impact because that's been released. Whereas the programming language is still, you know, under wraps. Integrate loot boxes into the language. That would be great. <laughs> 